with a pagination of like 1,000 pages, it will only go to the first 10 and it will index a few related videos. But if you do something chaotic and circular and cross-reference, it will index everything. And you know you, you have succeeded when Google tells you that he's lost in the maze. <laughs> At this point, and Google is indexing everything on your site. It, doesn't, it isn't able to detect the structure of your site. And you have so many pages indexed on Google that even if your page doesn't have um, any page rank or reputation or anything, you just get traffic because you have millions of pages indexed. So the flow of my project was basically um, get some content for the database, launch some sites, and receive traffic from Google, and through ads, and gain money. As you can see, there's a direct correlation between all of these elements. So to increase the money, I just need to increase everything else. And that's when my project became about quantity and not quality. And that's also why um, <laughs> a couple of months ago I decided to quit. I gave up the project to some friends and because I, I made it to gain money before going to, to college and, and because I, I didn't have enough money. And, but it went so well that now I have for a few years and I just gave up. And another reason for giving up is that this project is only like a battle against Google and finding new ways to prevent the new ways to prevent your new ways, constantly fighting and it's getting better at solving the maze and detecting sites like ours. So now let's review the infrastructure. And for the servers I went with DigitalOcean. I actually tried several ones, like Ramnode and Linode, which were very immature, very simple, and the API the APIs didn't offer what they needed. And then I tried Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud, which were overcomplicated and too many options that I didn't need. So this option was just what I needed, with a very close support and very friendly. And here you can see every dash is a data center of DigitalOcean. They have this, um, data centers in Singapore, LA, Toronto, everywhere, basically. And the core of my project are the clones. Okay, not this kind of clones, but small servers with half a gigabyte of RAM and one core, which run a web application and renderize the, the websites. Um, they are they are basically running a chunk application to renderize the site, so they don't need any more power. Then I have uh, an Elasticsearch server with eight gigabytes of memory and four cores, <coughs> with all the database. And then in another, in another data center, I have a scrapping server with half the power which is constantly updating the content of the, my main Elasticsearch server. And then I have a replica of the Elasticsearch server. And this is not really a replica like in a cluster, because if, if I made the cluster in different continents, uh, for every request, they will have to communicate, and that would be fatal. And so instead what I did was um, keep these two working together, and every day I would copy the database from the master to the replica, and that way I could I keep it updated. And also, well, the, the main point of having two servers was um, availability. So if one went down, the other, um, the clones would be able to switch and <coughs> use the database of the other server, and also for latency. So the clones that would be spread across the, glo the globe would connect to the Elasticsearch server that gave them better response time. Then I have a small server where I hosted the admin that was a junk application from which I controlled everything, like the configuration for every clone, for every web website, the status of the scrapping, uh, everything, absolutely everything. 
And then I had, I had a few weeks earlier with four gigabytes of RAM in two cores, which uh, for those who don't know, PVIC is an alternative to Google Analytics. And it's basically the same. And, and I needed to use PVIC instead of Google Analytics for two reasons. And Google doesn't have an API for creating um, sites and creating tracking codes for sites. So if you want to make something like I did to launch uh, 200 sites, you can't do anything manually because you will, go, you will go crazy. And secondly, because I couldn't give any information to Google about my sites. If I launch 200 sites and my objective is to fool Google and I put them on the same account, uh, Google will shut me down from one day to that. And then I will have the clouds spread uh, across all the data centers. I became really obsessed about the uptime, not because the traffic and the money I would lose um, during the downtime, but for the long term implications that going down um, could mean because Google won't send people to a website that is frequently down. So I was using a status cake to monitorize the status uh, of all the, all the servers just if they were returning um, the correct HTTP codes. And then I had the status cake, a status cake um, communicating me when something went down to both push bullet and slack so my phone and my computer will go crazy. And then I used the Xiaomi Mi Run <laughs> that wouldn't stop vibrating when when something went down um, and it wouldn't stop until all systems were restored. So I could be on an exam with the phone uh, in silence mode and even in that case I would, I would receive the notifications. So now the part of the content. I scrapped it around five, well, 45 um, sites. And there are a little bit more or less. Um, this is from an updated version of the database. You can see the ID of the site, the name, the amount of content, and how many times it's used by its clones. Not um, every clone uses a subset of all the content. So not every clone uses the whole database. That way, I can kind of fool in Google thinking that they are different sites because every page looks different. And I know that 50 or so uh, scatter sounds like a lot of job, but I made my own micro framework for scrapping those sites because they were basically all the same. Um, a home page with the pagination and thumbnails. <laughs> so with my micro framework for scrapping, um, you're seeing right now the scrapper for this hamster. I just needed to overwrite the ID of the site, then specify the structure of the pagination of such site, then specify, uh, well, overwrite the function get thumbnails that basically given a page of the pagination returns a list with all the thumbnails on that page, and then overwrite the um, first thumbnail which given one of these thumbnails, extracts all the information that it needs. And in this particular case, for X hamster, the attacks didn't appear on the thumbnail. So I needed to make an external request and like go into the video to be able to find the tags. But this was no problem because the, my framework managed all the threading and had a threading pool for the request and, and for everything. So after seeing how simple one of those scrappers is, it's not that much of a, a merit. Once I got the data, I put it in Elasticsearch. The, this is a simplified version of the, of the mapping. Uh, on the left, you, there's nothing special. I'm only storing data. The magic happens on the right, where I tell Elasticsearch to create indexes for the title and the tags and this gives me an amazing performance, like making 4,000 searches per minute over 10 million documents at like 40 milliseconds 
and this is with only one scalpel. So this was very important in my project because um, on every page, like uh, in a video, for example, the related videos were actually fetched with a search of the title. And in every page, I was making searches. Um, now that we have the content in Elasticsearch and the scrapper running, um, you are seeing the admin panel that I made. And the first field, OK, it's the admin panel, and we are seeing the configuration for the hamster following the same example. The first field is only telling um, where the, the content is stored, like Elasticsearch master in this case, but the name is different. And then we have some general information about the site. We have, for example, uh, the name, the domain, the language, the contact URL if we need it, and we could enable or disable any site with just one checkbox. And here we have an interesting field that is the, the embed, I think. If we had to store the full embed for every video into Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch will automatically upload that to memory. And that will, that will simply blow everything up. So instead, what I did was store on the admin the structure of the iframe, e and then only store in Elasticsearch the, the fragments that changed from video to video, like some kind of basic compression. The rest of the fields are just storing the, the state of the, of the index. And here, things get a little more complicated. And because Elasticsearch allows you to specify any PMIP or ID that you want in any format that you want, I, I use some sort of array where the initial position is the, the ID of the site multiplied for one million. So the first video, fixed videos, oh, X hamster, sorry, um, would be the two million, the second one, two million and one, and so on till the end. And this allowed me to fetch um, videos randomly at constant time. So for example, if we have a site that is using the content from, sorry, if we have a clone that is using the content of site two and three, and we want to get 20 random videos, all we have to do is generate 20 random numbers in the union of the ranges of that content, and then get the videos with such IDs. And then we have random elements with filters in constant time. This comes with a little problem, that is that when you remove a, a video, there's a gap there. So what I did was to replace it with a pointer to another element, another random element of the same set. And this just works fine. We don't have so many removals. Um, but uh, comes with the downside that now this video um, has doubled its possibility to appear, but well, it's not that bad. If someone knows a better way to do this that doesn't imply um, moving and scrolling everything, bring it on the question section. Now let's see a little bit of the, the clones itself. And to do so, we will see how the process of launching a clone, basically. First of all, uh, we need the domain. And because this project was based in search engine optimization, we, I wanted domains that had some keywords uh, specifics to, to follow. So I would generate a list of candidates with some permutations or something like that. Then I would query a quiz server and see whether or not they were available or not. This comes with the downside that the quiz server has some limitations on the amount of requests you can make. So I came up with an alternative that is first uh, get the candidates and then try to resolve the DNS. The DNS. If, it's, if it resolves, you already know that this domain isn't available. <laughs> and if it doesn't have any record, 
then query the who is and see if it's available. This allowed me to check a lot of more um, domains and get better ones and in the end better results. Then for buying the domains I, I went with Prenum basically because they allowed me to become a reseller and they gave me an amazing price and had a good API, API sorry. And this only makes sense if you are going to buy like 200 domains, otherwise go with any other domain seller. And now it's time to create the server. Uh, it was as easy as going to the admin panel, uh, naming, sorry, naming the server and choosing a location. And when letting the IP in blank, the admin will know that it has to create a new server. So, on the click save, uh, the admin will communicate with DigitalOcean and create me the server on set location based on a previous snapshot. And then the admin will also talk with New Relic and initialize the server for CPU monitorization and memory and things like that. Then we have to. Um, uh, then we have to configure uh, the clone, the properties of the clone itself. As we can see, the server has already been set. Then we have to choose from which sites it will use for the, the content. And here's a property embedded Peralta, which is the ID delta, that is basically going to displace the ID of the videos. So if you have, if I have this video, and I'm repeating content on several sites, this video will appear in more than one time. With the ID data, I'm displacing this number right here, up or down, based on the ID data, and this way I trick Google into thinking that it's not duplicated content because the URL is not the same. And also remember that the related videos are a set of the name of the video, so because every clone has a unique subset of content sources, every related video is different from clone to clone. So Google has no idea that this is duplicated content. The rest of the configuration is just SEO search engine optimization fields. Uh, the URL, the domain, the title, the title, description, keywords. And then we have to create the three week instance. Just it's just clicking here on save and it automatically creates it through the API. And then we need to choose the add zone. And we need uh, an add zone is like a configuration for the apps of your site. In this case I will use on the desktop that will only show ads on the desktop and this is how it looks, the configuration of this add zone. And I could create several ads and specify where they would go, like, for example, a um, sex shop banner would go on the top and was able to go on mobile and desktop. And based on, on this, I just needed to, to check what I wanted or not. Then, uh, we, we are still configuring the clone. Uh, you specify the language for the user interface. We have 20 languages. This is just like for the search button, contact button, the general user interface. And then we have the translation language, which is uh, um, something I'm very proud of. We use end-to-end -end translation. So if this is a normal search where a user is searching potato in English and we search potato in a database in English, and we give results in English. With end-to-end -end -to -end translation, what we do is take a word like patata in Spanish, translate it from Spanish to English to potato, run the sites in English, get the results in English, and then translate those results to Spanish. So the final experience for the user is that it searched potato and got results in Spanish also. And the way I made the translation <coughs> was getting the, the top 10,000 words more frequent on my database, then translating them with Google Translator, 
and then making uh, two dictionaries, everyone in what in both ways. And I couldn't use uh, real time translation with an API or anything because there were many requests per second. And this was a very, very, very basic translation because this was word by word based. So we destroyed everything, but made Google think that this was new content. <laughs> it's the point of everything. <laughs> then we choose the the, theme, the how the 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 website we will look. And for this, I use Bootstrap, which is just an HTML5 framework that makes assigning sites very easily. And then Bushwatch, which is a collection of themes that, uh, with just changing a line of code, allows you to, to change the whole appearance of your site without breaking anything, thanks to, to Bootstrap. This was just visual because Google doesn't look into the appearance of the sites, but, but we, I made it them anyway. <coughs> then I have some parameters like the amount of videos to show in the index, and the amount of related videos, the amount of server search results, and the option to enable or disable this, this random search box down here. And then we have the URL layout. How many of you are familiar with Django? Okay. This is very important. Um, if, if I need all my sites in English, I mean, I want to make clones like this, for example, that will be in Spanish. And if you use the same URL like layout, and for the pagination I use, for example, slash page slash, it will be kind of wrong because, because it should be slash pagina slash. So I make uh, a user interface for changing the URL layouts of every clone from the admin panel. I choose to which class it goes, the structure, and whether it's active or not, a priority because in the Django admin panel I didn't know if there was anything to change the order more easily, so I just went with numbers. And I think it's a good moment to point out that this is the default Django admin, but I'm using Django Suite, which uh, is just a model you, you put it into Django and makes the, the admin look very beautiful. And, it, and this was very crucial also to experiment with different uh, page structures and just to, to add more variety to my clones. And the final steps were run overriding the unsafe method on, on the Django admin, and was basically to initialize the application with Elasticsearch. Now the application for response time, not the server that we did before. Also initializing status gate, and, and pointing the domain name from Freenum to the DNS of DigitalOcean and then pointing the DigitalOcean to DNS server to the clone itself. And then uh, I had to maintain, maintain the, the clones, like modify the, um, the web application that the clones were running. So I went with, with this development flow where I have a Git repository, a development branch where I developed, and once I had a, a candidate release, or to say it some way, I, I pushed that to a test branch that went into a subset of the clones that weren't very important, and I let it run like for a couple of days and see if everything worked fine, and then once the once it worked fine, I moved from test to production, and the code will go to all of my clones. Uh, I made this update with a cron job that checked like every 10 minutes if there had been any change to the repository. It's not a very good solution, but it worked. And well, yes, that's basically it. That's basically what I did.
and thank you all very much. not how many users you can handle per minute, but Google that is indexing you constantly, the Google bot. With one of these clones, you will reach um, 1,000 requests per minute. If you have one site that starts to go up, and we had a few that started to get more uh, attention from Google, and the speed uh, started to go up, we would simply update it and go to one with two cores. Because when you create, you're going to fit your server down? Sorry, or? sorry he was yeah. with No, that was boring, yeah. But ah. Oh, I don't know. Whatever. Okay. You create a new clone, okay? You have a new domain, everything. How does Google index you for the first time? Do you connect the clones to each other or? And a long time ago, you would have to create a webmaster tools account and say, Google, I exist. Or you would have to go to, to some website and make ping to Google. Yeah. But right now, when you buy a domain, um, someone, somewhere, I don't know how, knows that you bought the domain and publishes it in some directory. So after one week or so, Google reaches your site. You don't have to tell him anything. Mm, that someone knows. I don't know. <laughs> 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 One thing is that they have cited for all the domain, but another thing is how do you appear on, on the search so so fast? And it's not so fast. <laughs> okay. okay. You think it. and it can take like around a week for Google to find you. Then two couple of months until you start to get traffic from Google. So it's not really fast. Well, two months is, is very fast, actually. <laughs> I mean, for any company that wants to appear in Google, do this kind of SEO is quite fast. But, but <coughs> this was about, about quantity and <coughs> quality. Uh, the, the, there were, the sites didn't have a lot, a lot of, of traffic. The average one had maybe like um, <coughs> 500 users per day. Then we had some that, for some reason, spike. But we don't know if that answers your question. Okay. No. Do you ever do you ever reuse your the, the domains? What happens uh, if a node fails, for example, gets destroyed or whatever? <laughs> um, no, actually, the part where I say that I have a network or. 200 domains is actually kind of false because there are actually only 100 domains running because you um, for example uh, like six or seven months ago we were generating tags randomly with just to, to get more links and something like that and Google said that that was automatic automated generated gibberish or something like that and banned all of our sites all of a sudden, boom, no traffic for any of our clones because it was a change in the algorithm, so those domains were dead, for example. And then start again, no money, two months. <laughs> <laughs> I said that, that I quit partly for this because it was just a battle and... Any more questions? Uh, about the URLs in Spanish. Um, so you save those in in the database, I presume. Uh, well, the major like performance gain you get for setting the URLs in the URLs that buy is because you set them there. 
And if you say it in the database, would that like <coughs> slow down a bit? No. Um, I, I don't know where to I think that this is the base. The clones, when they put. Oh, okay, okay. You save those. They, okay. they poke the admin panel and get the configuration. And then with some weird meta programmation, I, I make like. I generate the code to, to make the URLs and run an eval, and that's all. So the performance is the same. And uh, my second question regarding that, uh, didn't you think of using, did you think of using um, uh, Django's internet, internet nationalization module to like change the URLs dynamically based on the language? Because it has that feature in Django, you can put that in URLs and change the URLs based on the language you choose. Mm. Did you think of that or did you try it or didn't try it at all or just like... I had a problem with my project that it's that before starting it, I didn't know anything about anything. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of times I had two options, implement something by myself or learn a tool that already exists. And Implementing it directly was faster, and so no, I didn't use internationalization with Django. I made a dictionary file with the keyword and the translation for every language. So, so one clone was exactly one language. You, didn't, you couldn't change the language of the clone, right? Yeah, I could go to the to the admin, and well, there are a lot of slides anyway. I could go to the admin, change the the language of the clone, and every ten minutes. The clone will poke the admin, saying, okay. "Hey, have there oh, been okay. any changes on my configuration? And if there have been any, uh, it will just restart Django." Yeah, but the visitor could not change the, the ah. language of the site. No. It was just one language. No, oh, exactly. Okay. Okay. So if I go to the first slide, for example. So the tra the internationalization module wouldn't apply to you, I guess. If the user doesn't change the language, then it's fine. Yes. Okay. Here, for example, in this site, I had the, the link, you know, to yeah. Spanish, but was actually uh, to another domain. Ah, okay. So, no, in terms of Okay, cool. <coughs> Questions? Uh, did you guys use any kind of cross-promotion between your sites? Um, we tried. In fact, with the same example of the, of the site in another language, and in some cases it had a good effect. In some other cases, it didn't have a good effect, and it also had negative effects in some cases. But uh, my experience is with 200 sites, and I don't have a, a sample big enough to make any conclusions. So I, I can't share with you any significant information. Okay, and also, what was your biggest uh, problem that kept your uptime at? I don't know, 100% besides Google banning you? Um, digital Ocean Network problems. Mm, they had a few, like, every couple of months, uh, one of the data centers will would have low latency or, or they will go down, like, for one minute. Nothing very critical, but everything was fault of digital Ocean. <laughs> okay, so if you are here, you can stop now the question, and any other question will be the pizza and beer room. <laughs> okay. Thank you.